How's it going, everybody? And thank you for joining me on Out of the Both Rows for Word, Weekly Word Wednesday. So I'm going to go ahead and do this um, week's reading a little bit differently by opening up and kind of explaining where I'm coming from before reading uh, the different verses that I have here. And there's a couple that kind of cover the same thing, so I have a few to go over. Um, when I was younger, uh, like really young, I was probably not even 10 years old yet, I believe is as far back as I can remember. Um, I used to, for like a lot of my anguish and pain and misery, guilt, all kinds of different negative emotions that I was going through, I used to seem to self-harm and mutilate myself um, in some kind of, I guess, idea that that was going to make up for whatever was going on in the situation at the time, whether it be uh, my emotions towards the situation and pain I was feeling or maybe the pain I had caused other people. Um, it seemed to be um, one of the most, I guess, both relieving and um, burdensome ways of going about anything um, and it really truthfully didn't do anything um, every single time that I seem to do that the only real good um, not even good but the only kind of attention you seem to get from that is really just people who are concerned with what's going on and uh, out of fear are probably um, kind of reaching out because they don't know what to do in that situation so they want to kind of be affectionate towards you and it did seem to kind of get attention I'm not sure if that was 100% the driving force behind everything um, but that is one of the elements so some people are doing it to seek attention other people are not they are hiding it um, they're doing their best to cover up everything um, and in those situations those people are going through a lot as well but they're as being a person who chose to do this throughout my life, it is completely the most ridiculous way you can try and make amends, um, relieve stress, relieve pain. All you are doing is harming yourself. So in that, whatever weird concept you're getting in your own mind, um, and even the chemicals in order for your body to cope with the um, harm that it's receiving, all of those are actually meant to um, almost be like a response or a shock uh, to your body and that's kind of that feeling you seem to get when you do choose to do this uh, but you are immediately causing pain to yourself you feel this but you feel you deserve this pain sometimes um, and that seems to get you through it um, there's other times too where I thought that it was possible to atone to God or to make amends or to show him that I truly was uh, remorseful for what was going on and for the most part that's that's never going to seem to get his he's not going to address that kind of attention seeking um, he doesn't want us to harm ourselves or to live in such a way that we are punishing ourselves outright knowingly in order to somehow get closer to him um, I have heard a lot of ways of asceticism explained as far as restricting yourself from certain things um, and I believe that's a, a misrepresentation of what asceticism truly should be considered uh, restriction and discipline, the ability to withstand certain cravings for periods of time in order to be constructive to put other things first, that's not asceticism at all. Um, that's plain being an adult. Uh, asceticism is more of the fact that you believe that you can make, you can actually get a, a more godly lifestyle by um, punishing yourself. So if you like something and you, for whatever reason, believe it's against God, that um, you don't, 
you just consider yourself to be wrong for even having that craving and that emotion. It's not good to feed into those and to let those pass through you, but to punish yourself for even having the thought isn't necessarily the way that we should go go through with it. Um, we're supposed to process that thinking and correct it and get it to the way that we believe Jesus Christ would be directing us to think. Um, every every concept, every thought, we should take it and correct it so that it, it forms with what it is the personality of Jesus really is and how he would have guided us. Um, or finding out outright that it's a misguided direction and that you shouldn't even go that way and it's completely against God. That's a more better way to address the situation as far as um, figuring out how to get closer to God or something like that. Try your best to analyze things and process them the way that you believe God would form them in your mind. Because not every thought comes from him. There are plenty of other uh, familiar and evil spirits running around constantly trying to conjure up misguided direction that looks good at first and then later on down the road just adds to your amount of guilt, your amount of withdrawal, um, your inability to believe God wants you to come back, which is absolutely what he wants. Um, the entire thing is literally him trying to give us all a way to come back to him because that's what he truly wants is us all to be in fellowship and to live the life that he saw as a good life without all these self-added problems that we seem to pile on on top of what already is difficult in life um so as far as the asceticism goes, you should never try to directly punish yourself. Um, if God wants to correct you, he will correct you. You listen to that correction and you go with the guidance. Um, but for the most part, when you choose on your own volition to try to atone to God in a way that isn't with his word, um, you're creating your own ways and you're guiding yourself and you're not allowing God to guide you um, and if you're choosing to do these things you're actually uh, showing more of being guided by evil spirits and demons and Satan himself and not by God if you're choosing to self-harm and to mutilate yourself and to attempt to atone through um, truly anything other than honest belief and remorse and your ability to understand the resurrection and to understand that Jesus came and was the Son of God. Um, that's about Jesus came and atoned for us. There's no way that we can take that from him without trying to uh, put ourselves above him in that place. And that's really what it looks like. God sacrificed Jesus on the cross to make atonement for us. There's no more blood sacrifice or offerings that we can truly give that are going to give us any more atonement or somehow get God to see our way or to answer our, our cries. Because if we are choosing um, to be, it really looks like you're throwing a tantrum. And, um, you are disrespecting the temple of God when you choose to harm it. It's like tearing down the walls yourself. Um, and in that, um, you're disrespecting yourself. You're disrespecting the creation that God has made. And it, if you disrespect God, it's, it would, in my mind, make it very difficult for me to see why he would um, address things the way that you see fit. You're already disrespectful. You're probably not even thinking things in a way that God sees it or God would direct it or would guide you. Um, so in that sense, if you are someone that is mutilating yourself um, and you truly are doing it because you're trying to atone to God, you're trying to get some kind of result out of it, I highly encourage you to stop immediately. Um, 
reach out to somebody that you can trust and let them know that there are times where um, when you become emotionally distraught or guilty or you feel disconnected from God that you become unsafe around yourself and so when they start to see that pattern they can kind of at least warn you and let you know hey it looks like you're going back into a dark direction um, I'm hoping that that's not where you're going and if there's anything I can do for you let me know um, it's got to be somebody who's strong in the Lord who trust you can trust um, I would highly encourage it's someone of the same sex as you and a mature adult um, not just somebody who cares for you but does not truly understand what's going on um, because they will in their ability to try and guide you may actually um, be underhandedly condoning what's happening by not um, being stern with the situation and truly showing that you're actually withdrawing yourself even more um, it's displeasing to God for you to do this to yourself and you will find out later on because immediately right now you may be getting some relief but years down the road, believe me, it is going to be something that will constantly make you wonder why you even chose to do these things. Um, if, you, if you can make it past that point, there are plenty of people who do this and unfortunately their lives end quite early um, because of, of this mutilation and the harm you're doing yourself, your body can only take so much before it's no longer able to respond anymore. Um, same thing goes for drug use as well. That's a, a form of self-harm and mutilation. Um, and as you escalate that, as you need more of that substance in order to get you the same level that you were at in the first place, you're both creating an idolatrous situation. Um, because your life is difficult, you're drinking the myrrh blend that Jesus refused when he was carrying the cross. Um, Sorrow, pain, these kinds of things are, are going to come in life. Um, and if we address it by numbing ourselves, by trying to have a chemical reaction or get affection in the wrong sense, um, it will later on add to that guilt, add to that list that we've created for ourselves of all the wrongs we've done. And in this situation, it creates a really big problem, especially for the believers. Um, I mean, I have plenty of scars everywhere on me. Um, and no matter what situation, whether I'm looking in a mirror, I'm staring down at a table, those will always be there. And I personally have been able to work through a lot of it, and I don't necessarily see them um, in the same pain that I used to, um, cause at first, you know, I used to feel bad because of emotional pain losses, um, or the harm I've done others. And I used to, to cut myself or sandpaper burns. Oh man, all kinds of things that were just completely disgusting to think about. Um, and especially as a child to think, where these concepts even came into your mind. That's really interesting to think about because as a child, you're not even really sure what mutilation to yourself really is and to think of you cutting yourself with razor blades or doing all these other things. Um, where a child would even get that concept is very concerning. And in that too, um, when we die to Christ and are risen again in our baptisms, when we choose to be atoned and we believe full-heartedly in the Son of God, in the resurrection of Christ, um, God no longer is looking at that sin. We have, we have been called back to him. And, and our, through our sanctification, through the word and the constant reading, becoming clean again. Um, and it's very difficult to do that when everything that you felt made you dirty, when everything, every memory, every concept is literally written on your skin. Um, 
every negative emotion has been carved into myself in some way so that God no longer sees the things that I have done wrong and only sees um, me through Christ. There are times where I can't give myself that same forgiveness because I can directly see what it was that I did incorrectly and immediately, if I'm not careful, can go right back to that thought process of how could I have done this and things like that. It's, we all make mistakes. We all um, don't have a full understanding of what right-mindedness is just by living in the world. And until God helps us with that, until we seek knowledge and he chooses to give us, give us wisdom, um, we're never going to truly have a full grasp of what proper, what is really pieced together. We're going to have fragmentations and our good ideas are not even going to be close most of the time. And we may see it as like, it's so obvious how perfect it is. Our thought process is so obvious how um, we're right, everyone else is wrong, your thought process is incorrect. And just that alone tells us how far off we are. Uh, especially if it's not the way God would want us to think. And so in that, before I begin to read, I would like to kind of just add that last section is, um, God does not want us to um, live in this constant, burdensome, downtrodden, I need to harm myself and make up for everything I've ever done wrong. Um, he doesn't want us to do that. That's death. That is death in itself right there. There is no way to live in that lifestyle. And that's exactly what he wants us to do. He does not want us to live a deathful, just horrible, downcast life. He wants us to be living sacrifices. He wants our life to be the sacrifice. He has given us everything that we need written right here in front of us in order to have a full life. And we don't understand that and we think this is controlling. That if we don't do these things that he doesn't love us. He always loves us. He loves his enemies. He loves his friends. That's, that's just his character in itself. So that's not it at all. And he truly wants us to follow the word here because it keeps us from doing things that we cause guilt to ourselves. And that if we choose to do these, the only real things that are going to cause us sorrow and pain are the pain of others. And in that, you actually can go ahead and, and begin to live amongst them and help them when you're not so focused on your own pain and constantly dragging yourself down. Um, and when we choose to sin against God, we withdraw from him. We have guilt. We have shame. We have things that we can't cope with. And we choose the wrong ways to try to make amends and further find a reason that we believe God doesn't love us. And we're creating that situation for ourselves because we don't truly understand what love is. You need to first be patient and kind. And when you're choosing to harm yourself for making a mistake, that's not patience. That's not kindness. Everybody has mistakes in their lives. And so you need to find a way that is constructive. Maybe you need to speak to people that you've harmed. Maybe you need to talk to somebody about what it is that's causing you harm and why it is that you can't cope with it. So I just encourage you guys to, to seek life through this word um, and to live. And that is the sacrifice, to live this life and to show others that this life here is good. So I'll go ahead and get into the reading. And I'm going to go ahead and start in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16. And I'm going to go ahead and read the whole section here. And it's uh, entitled... Elijah on Mount Carmel. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. 
When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the prophets and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will, I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, What you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call in the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is in deep thought. Or busy. Or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom. Until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one from each of the tw tribes descending from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two sayas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water from the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. 
Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, Go back. The seventh time the servant reported, A cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, Go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So in that section, we can kind of see um, there is a test because um, everyone is coming against Elijah, and no one is, is seeking the Lord anymore. They're all believing in, in Baal. Um, and those Israelites that were with God, they're now wavering on the fence. They're not sure what to do. Um, they've given up on their God, and they know that that um, if they truly believe in Baal, that, that they've gone against God completely. So they're not even sure how to answer. Um, and so the prophets of Baal directly are the ones being engaged so that you can see at the end of this... Um, who truly is cloaked in the power of the Lord. And um, in this we can see that it's the custom of, of the prophets of Baal that they cut themselves till they're bleeding in order to um, try and get a response from their God. And as you can see, it, it clearly says there that no one answered them. Um, and then later on too, Elijah, after God uh, burnt the sacrifice and showed all the people that he does exist and that he is truly here, um, he tells them to bind up all the prophets of Baal. So that kind of leads us into the next section here, which jumps into the New Testament um, where Jesus is addressing people. <clears throat> So I'm going to start by reading, um, let's see here, it's in Matthew, and it's going to be Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. It says, when he arrived at the other side in the region of Gerdrines, I'm mispronouncing that, I'm sure, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So here we can see um, they felt they were going to be tortured by Jesus Christ. Um, and they felt it was not their time uh, to, to have this torture come, come upon them. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. So he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Go ahead and skip here to Looks like I lost my page here, but we should be in Mark. Here we go. This is Mark chapter 5. Then he went across the lake to the region of the Gerasins. When Jesus got out of the boat, 
A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirit came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank in the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. I'm going to go ahead and read the last section before I do my closing here. And it's going to be in Luke. And I believe it's chapter 8 as well again here. Yeah, chapter 8, verse 26. The healing of a demon-possessed man. They sailed to the region of the garrisons, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the garrisons asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to him to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away 
and told all over town how much Jesus had, had done for him. So in these few sections, we can see that Jesus wants us to stop that lifestyle. He does not want us to continue to harm ourselves, to continue to seclude ourselves, isolate ourselves, simply because of these evil spirits driving within us. Seek the Lord, kneel before him, be willing to place yourself at his feet, because you'll find out if you live this lifestyle long enough truly what that is. And that's, that's a place of honor as well, um, if you're willing to, to humble yourself and place yourself there. Um, and we can see here back in, in the other sections, this man may have been possessed by the same demons that were possessing the prophets of Baal. And in the same sense, we're, we're picking up right where that left off in the sense that Elijah had given the order to bind up all these people, to chain them, to, to uh, make sure that they were restrained. Um, and we can see um, that that may have been just so that Jesus could truly show his mercy on, on these people. Um, so if you are choosing to try and seek God by harming yourself or by isolating yourself because you believe... Um, that somehow you will get closer to God in that direction without it being truly what you're led to do in the first place. Um, because sometimes a little bit of isolation is good when we're reflecting on proper thoughts, when we have the mind of Christ and we have a right mind. Um, but before that, when we're choosing to act out this way, the best thing we can do is probably something I've heard uh, as a child, which is literally just go sit on your hands, like stop acting. Stop making an action. Stop moving. Your next choice is going to be your downfall. Uh, and you can clearly see that. So sit down and don't act. Pray to the Lord without harming yourself. And, and let him know what it is you're feeling, what direction you think you're going in, why it is um, that you're so stable, not stable, but why you have placed yourself to, to sit down and to wait. Um because you see your next action is, is improper. And instead of sinning, just keeping the thought, when you actually act it out, that's when when you also have something else there to, to give you a cause of, of a reason why you, again, will not think of yourself as good enough. Um, so I encourage you, every time you want to go down the wrong road, no matter how much that urge is driving you, the next step you take when you're going through those demonic thought processes and you're not asking the Lord Jesus to push them out, you're feeding them and you want to, to draw them in, or you're doing what the prophets of Baal did or the man who lived amongst the tombs and you're choosing to tear your clothes off, cut yourself, um, and act wildly, um, you're going to, to continue to add to those same demonic forces. And it's a spiraling force to just allow them all to feed off of you. Um, so I highly encourage you to just remove that from your life. And the thought process is not necessarily the worst thing. That's the place to battle it. So when you get the thought, do everything you can to live in the Word. Seek the Lord Jesus Christ and cry out to Him. And seek Him with all your heart because with a disingenuous heart, you truly don't want this. And so when you come with Him with a genuine heart, that's you really being repentful. That is truly you being sorry for the life you've lived. So in that, do your best to do your lifestyle, your actions in correct order of what it is we have been asked to do. Because in that, yes, we will have things that are pleasurable that we won't touch. There will be things that other people are doing that seem to them to be enjoying, to be full of hope, to be full of all of these great things that it's actually the Lord giving us. And because they have 
given their hopes and dreams and ideas into the wrong things, when that falls short, they're going to be right back in the same place. Or when that no longer satisfies and they find themselves having to chase that dragon, um, you know, the dragon is like, oh, you just need a little bit more. Or, you know, it's that... it. I have a, a very interesting perspective on how a dragon speaks, and I don't think it's actually brutish. Um, it's probably very, very calm and somewhat sweet sounding and that's probably the concern but that's just my own personal opinion nowhere does it say that um but do your best to resist all of those false temptations that are causing you to, to turn away from god well they're real temptations but they're a false hope they're a false guiding light and if you imbi or if you abide in and indulge in those pleasures and they're worldly and they're the things of Satan, like if, if the Lord Jesus would have decided just to fill his belly full of bread just because he was starving, um, that's one of those things that it's a survival mechanism. And, and that's also a thing we're trying to, to not rely on. We're not trying to be purely instinctual. Our instincts should be the mind of Christ and a heart for God. And, and in that, um, and with, with all of that, um, if we choose to be dramatic, and overly dramatic, extremely dramatic, violent, and somewhat to to be seen to um, be tyrannical. If 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 it wasn't for the fact that uh, we're the only one, <laughs> but it it would come off as that. But it's really just our demons that we've allowed to envelop in ourselves, um, and we need to do everything to to cast them out. And if Jesus comes to you and wants to remove those spirits from you, that's a blessing. Um, so don't don't hold on to those ideologies or those uh, quick releases because they will end up being another thing that you feel was a shortcoming. And for every shortcoming that you notice and you're not able to just easily um, forget or forgive um, because we should process some of our mistakes so that we can learn from them but there are other things that we're supposed to forgive ourselves for and when it's written on our skin there's no way we can do that so I hope that I at least reach somebody out there um, because this is a detrimental thing in life here to constantly be the burden of yourself so I truly ask that if you were listening, that I hope to God that he gave you the ears to hear what was going on in this passage um, and into my own personal experience. Um, and I just, I just hope you guys the best in all, all honesty. Um, and I hope to be seeing you guys soon and be hearing from you guys, um, especially if there's something out there that uh, you feel that if you don't, seek some kind of assistance you may no longer be here um, and we don't want to see that at all um, so with that I would just like to close um, and just tell you guys live a, live a life live for the Lord don't die thank you